Well, probably just like me, you are amazed, not by the fact that absolutely uncivilized means had been used against Trump, all the way up to assassination attempts, numerous assassination attempts. And I think he's not safe even now. The history of the United States has known many cases, but I think President Trump is a, is a smart person and a cautious one, I hope. But what, most, what amazed me most, that in fighting him, not only Trump was subjected to humiliating court procedures, accusations, and so on, but his family was attacked as well, his children was attacked. Gangsters don't do this in Russia. When criminal gangs fight, they don't touch children and women. It's men who fight among themselves. But those guys stooped as low as that. I think this is so... This looks so, so bad that it only reaffirms, reconfirms how low the political system of the United States has fallen. Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, December 1st, 2024. Let's get into it. All right, before we get into the news, <laughs> gotta, gotta tell a quick funny story about me. Went out on the trail at night, risked my life and limbs, spiders everywhere, had all kinds of, something was moving in the bushes. It was gonna be a great video, I got home, no sound whatsoever. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. Always test your sound before you make a video. Uh, anyway, just thought I'd get the fun part out of the way first. Uh, let's get into Syria. This is from the Iraqi uh, Christian Foundation. Syrian Christians in Aleppo, Syria, are in grave danger from invading demonic Al-Qaeda slash ISIS terrorists who have already begun removing all Christian de Christmas decorations and beheading captured soldiers. Western media are cheering on the terrorists and calling them propaganda term rebels. Please pray for our fellow Christians and other minorities in harm's way. And that's Iraqi Christians if you want to go uh, follow them on X. So we're going to get in. I'll talk to give you my summary of, of what I know as far as uh, what is, has gone on. Now, we know that Turkey uh, trained and equipped or Turkey, uh, Israel, and of course the United States and, and probably some other NATO were in there and they, they built up this force in Turkey, trained them and equipped them with just about every weapon known to mankind. I think there are about 15,000 that came across into uh, Syria. Okay, a very formidable force. Uh, now, what's happened is that the Russians have bombed them and they did kill a bunch of them. Uh, on the road, I've seen the uh, the pictures. I don't know how much I can show to you. I, I, uh, that's, I probably can't. Uh, so we'll, we'll just leave those out of a very, very bloody scene. All right, joining me now live is Musa Ibrahim, Executive Secretary of the African Legacy Foundation and previous spokesperson for the Libyan government back in 2011. Musa, always a pleasure to see you. Let's talk about Syria and what's going on now. What do you see as a potential goal of the, these militant offensive in Aleppo? I don't think the Murad, they have any goals of their own. They have been for many years pawns of American neo-colonialism in the Middle East. Uh, they are just uh, the foot soldiers uh, of the uh, plans uh, of Americans for the Middle East. Uh, the main target, of course, is to destabilize the area, make sure that not just Syria, Iraq, and the whole region 
is under continuous pressure and never able to unite or stand tall for themselves. But also, of course, we all know uh, to make sure that they are able to stab Russia in the back uh, and divert its effort, efforts in Ukraine away uh, towards the Middle East. So we should never think of these rebels as uh, independent uh, agents of themselves with their own plans, but as part of a bigger American plan for the region. Well, so it's interesting you say that. Let's take a sort of broader look at this. I mean, that this offensive has just come at a, at a time when, you know, uh, there was a ceasefire agreed between Lebanon and Israel. Is this, what do you think of the timing? Or is, it, is this just a coincidence that what's happening in Syria now is happening right now? Well, of course, uh, Israel is always involved in uh, such plans. Uh, being uh, uh, a far post uh, for uh, the imperialist West uh, in the in the region. So, uh, what Israel uh, wants to achieve here uh, with the help of the Americans is to cut any life blood, any support that uh, the Lebanese Hezbollah and the Palestinian Hamas uh, get from uh, either Syria or Iran, and to make sure that the whole region is divided and not connected. This is very important because for, uh, for the West, it has always been the case that the most threatening factor in, in the Middle East is the factor of unity. If countries come together, if uh, Arabs come together, uh, then uh, there is a major risk to the West's interest in the region. Of course, if Arabs then are able to uh, have an alliance with Russia, China, uh, and the BRICS countries, this means uh, it's an existential risk for the West. Unfortunately, uh, Israel, of course, is in the middle of this all, all of this game. And instead of seeing itself as a part of the region and seeking to find a peaceful and just solution to the conflict, uh, it's at the surface of the Europeans and Americans, and it gets involved in such violent plans to subjugate the region. So the main aim is to cut any support for Hezbollah and Hamas, and to make sure that the region remains divided, Syria from Lebanon, from Palestine, from Iraq, from Iran. And that's why the peoples, the nations of the Middle East must understand the game played by the Americans, they must unite and they must understand that they find friends in Russia and China and the BRICS countries, not in the West. Yeah, actually, that quite nicely leads me to my next question. I mean, as, as someone who saw his country, Libya, experience, experience a violent change of power, what can you say about the dangers for Syria at this point? Well, uh, the, uh, we saw all of the consequences of NATO's intervention in Libya in 2011. Libya became and remains a divided country with two governments, two parliaments, two armies, and hundreds, literally the UN states, hundreds of armed militias that are outside the law. Uh, Libyan oil is robbed by Western companies. The Libyan Central Bank is outside the control of the Libyan uh, people. Uh, Libya, which was the richest country in Africa per capita for decades, now is one of the poorest, most unstable countries. Uh, uh, ISIS and Qaeda-affiliated groups controlled parts of Libya uh, for years and years, and they still come back every now and again with such power. So such fate awaits Syria and awaits any country in which NATO or affiliates of NATO, like these Syrian rebels, uh, intervene. So I would like to warn not just the Syrian government, who is, of course, aware of all this, but I would like to, award, uh, to warn the Syrian people not to fall again for the false propaganda of the West and of those rebels claiming that they call for democracy and human rights, while the main aim is actually dividing Syria, weakening it, robbing its wealth, and making sure it never unites with Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Iran, or even Egypt in the future, and become a threat to the Western 
interests, colonial interests in the region. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Always a pleasure talking to you, Musa Ibrahim, Executive Secretary for the African Legacy Foundation and previously the spokesperson for the Libyan government back in 2011. Speak again soon. Thanks again. But uh, from what I understand, they're now in, in charge of uh, Aleppo. Now, a lot of people are predicting that Assad, uh, Assad, Assad's not well liked and he's not a very good leader. This could lead to his overthrow. Uh, I'm just saying. You know, I, I don't think Scott Ritter would agree with that. He, he basically feels that, you know, it's, it, they're going to push him right out and Assad will remain in power. But I'm not sure that the Syrian people are going to want him in there, uh, especially given what this situation has caused. OK, uh, and then the other uh, aspects of this is this is going to cut off the supply routes from Iran to Hezbollah. OK, and it'll also cut off the uh, supply routes from Iran to uh to Hamas and, and potentially Yemen. So, and then the background on this is, of course, we had the ceasefire that took place, uh, in, in my opinion, so that this, the focus could be on this attack into Syria. Okay, because now Israel doesn't have to deal with Hezbollah. Now, why did the ceasefire take place? Okay, it took place on both sides. All right, Israel wanted the, the ceasefire because they were getting their butts kicked in Lebanon. They hadn't advanced very far and they'd taken a lot of casualties. Not so many deaths, but a lot of casualties. There's been a lot of, a lot of uh, troops going in. And plus, from what I understand, the, their forces were very de uh, demoralized. Okay? Uh, they were ready for a break and that's why the ceasefire took place. Now, Hezbollah wanted the ceasefire, okay, uh, for m much of the same reason, but also now with the ceasefire, they can go down and help the forces in Syria because they're aligned with Syria to fight against this incursion in with ISIS and Al Qaeda. It depends on who you want them to listen to. Western media, they're rebels, they're, they're, they're wonderful people, and they're going in to liberate uh, territories of Syria. If you listen to the Syrian side, uh, these are Al Qaeda ISIS terrorists that the West has equipped and have brought in and are brutalizing uh, the people of Syria. Go find your own <laughs> information. Uh, I read to you yesterday what, or this, or yesterday morning what Scott Ritter had to say. So let's get into uh, some other information. So this is Big Surge. It is important to resist the urge to be hyperbolic and uncritically accept all the rumors. But I think we're looking at a further theater level collapse from the SSA, SAA excuse me, in northwestern Syria. They might lose Hama, H-A-M-A, -A, in the coming 24 hours. All right, so now we know the Democrats have started a whole new war in Syria. We got the war in Ukraine, which uh, we're going to talk about that. And, and also we got the war in uh, Israel against Hamas going on. So now they want to start a war in Georgia. Now, you could say this is horizontal escalation against Russia. OK, and against the enemies of Israel. All right. So you can see that the West is, is escalating things horizontally. But, you know, World War Three, you know, every time we start up one of these uh, these 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 bonfires, uh, you, you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, anyway, I mean, let's just pray the nukes don't fly. So this is uh, this is on Georgia. This is from Zlat 71. The president of Georgia, Salome. Uh, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this. Zora B. Kachivi. I, I did try to pronounce it. But anyway, it's, it's up above. I, I cutting and pasting. Stated that she will not resign despite the expiration of her mandate. She considers the parliament to be illegitimate. Her presidential term ends on December 16th. The State Security Service of Georgia reports there, there is an attempt at a violent seizure of power in the country. Now, from what I understand, a lot of people say that the West is flying in a lot of uh, protesters, and there's some pretty violent protests taking place right now in Georgia. So we don't know where that's going to go, and that's basically all I wanted to talk about in Georgia. So now we'll get into, uh, let's just talk about Ukraine for a minute, okay, and, and, and what's going on there. So you've got Gorka came out with this idiot statement that, you know, we're going we're gonna to arm Ukraine, you know, right? Russia doesn't come to the table, we're going to punish them. Well, you can't punish them with any more sanctions, 
because as I reported earlier, Gazprom has now been sanctioned. There's no, no sanctions you can levy on Russia anymore. And I already talked about the ruble and how it's going to be okay for Russia. All right. And what weapons are you going to send to Russia? And so that gets me to the topic that I wanted to talk about was we know that the hazelnut, the, the Oshwark, the, uh, God dang it, I had the pronunciation. The, uh, anyway, the Russian pronunciation of that, I'll put it up above. Uh, that missile was not launched today. And the reason for that, I believe, all right, was there were reports that the Russians, out of the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense, that they found the batteries that were launching the attackums. They didn't exactly say that these were the batteries launching the attackums. They just said that they blew up a bunch of HIMARS launchers, which I understand, maybe I'm wrong, they can also launch attackums. Anyway, there's been no further attackums that have flown into Russian territory that I know of from the two, uh, you know, from the warning when they hit once and then NATO launched again, okay, and, and since that second launch, Russia said, no, we're going to retaliate now. And they did, by the way. I, so maybe this was the retaliation, was they sent about 100 rockets and drones and everything else, and they blew the hell out of the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. So imagine being in Ukraine. It's wintertime there, just like it is here. Those people are going to freeze to death. So from what I understand, there's Roman blackouts and everything. So a lot of people in Ukraine are... are if, if they're not without power, they're having intermittent power. And uh, I don't know if the Russians are going to attack the energy grid again. That might have been just enough for the display of force. And they don't feel now because there hasn't been any more attackums. And maybe they got the launchers that it's not necessary to, to blow the hell out of the uh, uh, command and control, control structure. But I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I was expecting the launch on November 30th. And it didn't happen. So uh, let's move on. So that's it for Ukraine. That's a rundown in Ukraine. That's a rundown in Israel. Uh, oh, I did want to address, uh, uh, there was a comment about me being anti-Semitic. Uh, I am not anti-Semitic. I'm anti-Zionist. Okay, there's a difference there. All right, and let me just give you a little bit of background on the Zionist. If you didn't know, there's a PAC in the United States. The Israeli PAC. Uh, Damn it, it's slipping. I'll put it up above. Maybe a little information about it for you to read. They lobby Congress. In fact, they own Congress. They own the United States government, more or less. Uh, and, and so, in the United States, we are not allowed to have foreign lobbies in the United States. So imagine if there was a Chinese PAC or a Russian PAC. Uh, APAC, that's what it's called. APAC. Daggone it. Good. Glad I thought of it. I don't have to put it up above. APAC controls many congressmen they're all bought off and that's why to think about it you can buy a congressman for a million bucks two million bucks and they're going to send billions of dollars in u.s taxpayers to israel i don't think it's right the other thing i want to point out israel stole our nuclear weapons technology israel bombed the uss liberty israel is not an ally of the united states they will not come to the united states aid in our time of need if we ever have one OK, they are simply here to buy Congress and own them and operate freely within the United States. Now, are there uh, Zionists that are in charge of U.S. corporations? Yes, there are. So that's not being any. I, in fact, I'd like to study the, the, the uh, Jewish faith. All right. Just like I'd like to study the Hindu faith and Buddhist faith. But how much time have you got? I mean, I grew up. Let me just give you a little religious background here for you person that said I was anti-Semitic, anti okay, I started out a Baptist, then I became a Methodist, then a Protestant, and I've had a girlfriend, went Catholic for a while, and then I became a Mormon, so I've been a Christian uh, in many different religions. Now, I haven't studied the Koran, I do know uh, the Mormon, uh, I have studied the Mormon religion because I was one for a while. I only left the religion because of, uh, well, Two reasons. One was the tithe, and, but the, I didn't have a problem tithing. I just didn't want it going to Utah. I wanted it to help my local community. And the other one was they wanted me to, you know, it was all about breed, 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 have a family, have a family, have a family. And that just wasn't my style back then. I, I didn't want a big family, but I did want a family, though. But don't get me wrong. And then I met a woman and, I, and she already had kids. And so I just, uh, well, tried to adopt her kids. And anyway, we won't go in there. All right, so this is Insurrection Barbie. It has never been more clear than it is today 
that the Biden administration had zero plans of ever closing the border. They have never attempted to have these conversations with Mexico and Canada. It was all agreed upon in shady backroom deals that the border would remain open and the only people they lied to were the American public. Another thing that conspiracy theorists were 100% correct about. So you do understand how close we came to losing the United States completely. All right. The Democrat plan was to bring in all of these illegal immigrants, much like, and we're going to get to a couple of posts about what's taking place in Europe, because that's a disaster. And that whole immigration uh, situation that the globalists and the elites have done in Europe is irreversible at this point. All right. I think we can turn it back with Trump in charge. If the Democrats had continued along, you and I would be in a minority in the United States and the illegal immigrants would be the majority. And we would have never had a Republican administration ever again. They would all vote Democrat because the Democrats are paying for their housing. They're giving them a, a credit cards. They're, they're giving them a monthly uh, salary. Now, I did want to kind of, I want you to think about things. If Trump comes in and cuts off all of that sugar money to all of the illegal immigrants, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Where those concentrations of illegal immigrants are, there's going to be rioting. There's going to be uh, blood in the streets. I mean, how else are they going to feed themselves? They're going to have to rob everybody. And, uh, and so I'm, that's why I'm all for, okay, you've got, what is it? Uh, New York says the, the, the senator there, she wants to secede from the United States. That was in the news. Uh, and then you got Denver and they're saying, you know, we're going to protect illegal immigrants and we're going to, you know, no way we're going to give them over to ICC. I keep saying the simple solution to all of this is deport the illegal immigrants to the Democrat states. Give them to them. They want them. Okay, they're sanctuary areas. That way you don't have to pay all the money to ship. Well, the criminals you want to ship out of the United States, any criminals we catch. But the grandmas and the grandmas and, you know, well, that the Democrats want to call them or the kids and the families, just give them to the Democrat states. It's a lot cheaper than, than you know, taking care of them in the country. Let them pay for it. Let, let them pay for it out of their state budgets. We don't want, I don't want my taxpayer dollars going to pay for a bunch of illegal immigrants. I'm sorry. I don't. All right. So this is, uh, this is what I was talking about, uh, about Europe, because it's on the same theme. And this is from Wall Street Mav. There will be civil war in parts of Europe way before 2050. With the declining birth rates, Europeans are doomed. As Europe fills up with senior citizen native Europeans, a few children, do you think the new invading culture is just going to peacefully coexist with them? And they've got this nice graphic. I'm, sure, I'm showing it to you right now. It says Muslims in the EU, Norway, and Switzerland in 2050, high migration scenario. And then you'll have to read the chart. So percent of population that is Muslim. So if you're looking at the dark green, that's 18, 18 plus percent. The light green is 12 to 17.9. Uh, the lighter green is uh, 6 to 11.9. And then it goes down from there. You're looking at the graphic just like I am. Let's keep going. Um, this was a really good post by uh, Che Bowles. Uh, and uh, I just want to, I like this one. The... Uh, because it just it just makes fun of the Democrats again. <laughs> you know, I love to do that. Because uh, the, the, or the media, the, the the legacy media. I don't call them the mainstream media anymore. So the Russian army was supposed to be collapsing, but it's growing, advancing, and winning Ukraine. The Russian president was supposed to be isolated, but he just met two NATO leaders in the presidents of the biggest manufacturing economy and the biggest democracy on earth. The Russian economy was meant to be in tatters. Tatters, I say, I am van der crazy. Ursula van der crazy. Ah, they're in tatters. It will outgrow. And that's, that's Alex on the Duran. That's what he always says. Tatters. Western sanctions were meant to cripple Russia, but they failed gloriously. And they, they crippled Russia. I mean, Europe. They crippled Europe. Now, without Gazprom, here's another thing to, to think about. And I'm just, I think I talked about it in the last video. Those people in Europe are going to freeze, man. Where are they going to get their gas and their their natural gas and oil from? Except India, which is actually Russian oil and gas. They're just get, making it a whole lot more expensive now that Gazprom can't supply them gas uh, directly. 
So I think the United States is trying to destroy Europe because <laughs> they got their puppets in those governments and they just go right along with whatever the uh, United States tells them to do, no matter, no matter if it's in their self-interest or not. Ukraine was meant to be a democracy, but it's run by a corrupt dictator who bans all opposition, oppresses the church, and uh, dis discriminates against those speaking the language he grew up speaking. That's right. Did you know Zelensky grew up speaking Russian? And there you go. What, a little bit of information for you. The billion-dollar disinformation machine called Washington Mainstream Media, deeply infiltrated and co controlled by Western intelligence, peddles these lies and myths to you. They never retract their lies on the basis of facts. They, like their handlers and pro-war elites, simply escalate. The bigger the lie, the more people believe it. Stay awake. Recognize their motivations for what they are. It's only going to get worse as, at the, as the scale of their failure in Ukraine emerges. So speaking of Ukraine, since we're talking about Ukraine, I got some clips, uh, some more clips. You saw the one of um, Putin uh, warning Trump that there's going to be another assassination attempt. And uh, these are a couple more clips of Putin. I know. I, yeah, I'm a Putin lover. Yeah. Anyway, this is just what he has to say. Uh, just a couple. They were saying, yes, we are not going to let them join now. You know, why not now? Because they needed time to join NATO. So we are not doing this now. But after they prepared it, after it gets ready, they will make it join the NATO and they will pressure Europeans into accepting this. And what's happening now? It's happening in front of the entire world's eyes. Because this Europe out there ceased to exist as an independent center, independent sovereign center of the global politics. They are just dancing to the tune of the American leaders. They are doing everything they tell them to, even if it's to their own damage. And it seems that even at the highest level, including in Germany, people who are holding the highest offices, it seems like they are just carrying out some mission from the American special forces, but they are not working for the benefit of their own people. Now we've done everything in our power. Let's be let's be frank to drag Europe into a war against Russia. This is this did not begin in February of 2022. We've been doing this for years. We started decisively in 2014 when we destabilized Ukraine, replaced the government, we launched a coup all backed by the CIA and installed essentially a regime in uh, Kiev that was prepared to be hostile to Russia and carry out our interests. <laughs> so, is this the future Europeans want? Uh, and now you have this uh, ruling elite, if you will, governing all of your countries, telling you that this is wonderful, that everyone should go to war with Russia, and depicting Russia as though it were still a Soviet state under Stalin, which is absurd. None of that's true. You emphasize that Moscow is ready to respond to further escalation. I didn't just point out, I said we had done that last night. So in this connection, what measures Russia is going to resort to as a response? And are Western missiles still being used to deliver long-range strikes? Well, we have to use to ask the West about that, whether they intend to continue that about the risks. Of course, they, there are risks. That means involvement of Western countries, direct involvement of Western countries in an armed conflict. Of course, if Western specialists download flight paths and flight missions into missiles and sanction strikes against targets in Russian territory, of course, this entails a risk. And Tonight, they got their response. For two days, our armed forces were delivering missile strikes. And now there was a 90 missile, missile strike and 100 unmanned aerial vehicles used against 17 objects in Ukraine, military, military and industrial 
and utility objects, working for the armed forces and defense plants in Ukraine. And I'd like to say it now that, of course, we will respond to such acts of aggression against the Russian Federation. How, when and with what weapons is going to depend on the targets selected by the general staff of the Ministry of Defense. Because every target will be engaged using relevant instruments and weapons. For example, using a hypersonic missile against a minor target makes no sense because it's like firing a cannon against sparrows. But we will use every weapon in our disposal, at our disposal, without ruling out the use of Oreshnik missile complex against military and defense industry targets or centers of decision-making, including those in Kiev. Keeping in mind that, as I said, the Kyiv authorities continue to try to strike vital targets in cities of Russia, including Moscow and St. Petersburg. All right, so that's those clips. Uh, this is one by uh, uh, Colonel McGregor, and uh, it was basically, he was saying, what does a U.S. president need to know before entering into office? Now, this was an old video. Uh, but, you know, it's very relevant, and I wanted to include it in one of my videos, and he's just telling you what a U.S. president should be, and I think he's trying to give a little bit of advice to Trump. So, speaking of Trump, I did want, I, I, I was talking back about Kellogg. Kellogg is saying the same thing as Gorka. You know, we're going to punish Russia if they don't come to the table. He ain't going to listen to Kelly. I, Kelly's a maniac just like Gorka is, although he's loyal to Trump. But that whole peace plan that Trump's been putting together is not going to work. I mean, there's no way in hell. What do you think a president needs to be an expert in? Oh, this is a loaded question. I often go back to Eisenhower as a president because Eisenhower identified some of the attributes that he thought were important. He never set out to list them, but what emerges from his discussion are what I would call four, four important points. <clears throat> Every president must come to office, or in his view, should come to office with experience in certain key areas. Number one, economics and finance. He needs to have some background in it. He needs to understand how the economy works. You know, why do we want a weak dollar as opposed to a strong dollar? He needs to understand that. There are reasons for these things. Number one, economics and finance. How does trade work? Secondly, what about the international system? How does the international system work? Who controls the international system? Who are the key figures in the international system, right? Okay, so we've got finance, we've got the international system. Need to understand the American military establishment. This thing is enormous. It's absorbing a trillion dollars a year. It needs to be severely reduced in size and expenditure. Oh, that's unacceptable in Washington, but it has to happen. But you have to understand how it works. And what's the last attribute? The president needs to have some experience in domestic politics. And of course, Eisenhower had none. And so Eisenhower said, those are the, f those are the four things. It literally is what he said. All right, so that's, that's the video by McGregor. Sorry, I don't know where I put it in. All right, this is Matt Gates. Today's Democrat Party is an algamation. I got to look that word up. <laughs> I, Gates is smarter than I am, right? Of self-loathing celebrities, beta males, an angrilist, loneliest, loneliest of white women, transsexuals, some cool black women. We'd like to welcome on our side, TBH. Uh, let's keep going. So this was a, a this is not Jerome Powell, uh, and I, I'm putting the graphic up right now. But he did say, while you're looking at the graphic, legacy media is just a propaganda machine to fulfill their master's agendas. <laughs> and you remember when they kept going and everybody kept parroting the same phrase, this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 
every every freaking channel you cut on, Trump is a danger to democracy. I mean, what you want to talk about? Who's a danger to democracy? Democrats. Boy, is that party named wrong, huh? Holy moly. Ah, uh, boy, this is Dr. Alex Zek, and you know what? I'm just gonna. I tried to read these earlier, and but. I'm putting it up right now so you can read it for yourself. The CDC just dropped its 2025 childhood vaccine schedule. Here's what a perfectly healthy baby received in 0 to 12 months. And that's RSV. Like I said, I, the ones I can read, I'll read. Hepatitis B, Hep B, rota, rotavirus, diphtheria, tetanus, and I don't can't pronounce that word. Influence type B, HIB, can't pronounce the first word. Uh... Phenomacocal conjugate, P PCV15, uh, polio, IPV, COVID-19. Now, you know there's a lot of controversy now around the jab. And we're going to give this to babies? I don't think that's a good idea. I, I'm just saying there's been a lot of information coming out. Can't say too much because it'll get my video banned. I don't want it banned. Uh, anyway, influenza, measles, mumps, and rubella, can't pronounce that word, verb kill them, hepatitis A, hep B, 26 doses made by habitually criminal companies that aren't liable for injury slash death and profit from, from perpetual disease injected into a perfectly healthy baby. Uh, this was really interesting. This was Tom Clingston. We are still at war, and I, I put the graphic up for you to see. Uh, but if you click on it, it takes you to, to his website, and he's got a really good read here. You might want to go here uh, by, well, look, if you click on it, it says Z-I-M-M-Y-T-W-S slash Shutterstock. Let's see if he's got his, it doesn't really say, I don't see the link. I'll, if I get the link, I'll put, put the link that I'm reading. It says America is war, but we don't know it. As I've said often, more often than I can count, you can't win a war if you don't know you're in one. That's very true. You did, when this whole first thing started, I kind of knew we were at war with the Democrats when they were bringing across the Democrats, by, I mean, the illegal aliens by the thousands. You know, I knew when they put the vaccine mandate that that was a war being waged on the American people. You know, I knew when they spent trillions and trillions of dollars, they were trying to bankrupt the United States, that we were at war with the Democrats. It just went on from there. And so... It, it took a while for me to come to the full realization of how big that war was, but I think a lot of Americans are beginning to understand this. And it, that's the next phrase. To understand this, it would be helpful to reassess the recent election. At present, we see the election as a contest between different policies on immigration, crime, abortion, and the economy, and so forth. President Trump got the better of this contest. At the same time, we see it as a contest between competence on one hand and joy that is incompetence on the other. Remember the campaign? Joy, 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 joy. That was all that Kamala Harris was about. I, I, nobody, I still don't know where she stands. I mean, well, I know she stands at basically going to continue the Biden administration. That's about all I know. Wokeism and condensation, con, condensation, condensation on the part of the Democrats also work to Trump's benefit. This assessment makes it appear as if the election was a rather typical one, different in intensity, but not different in kind. It is true many thoughtful observers thought the election was very consequential, even as consequential as the election of 1860. I want to say it was even more consequential. But even most of these never thought the Democrats were running candidates that consciously sought to destroy America. Hyperbolic? I think not. The key to understanding the revolutionary nature of the election may be a video by a little-known academic by the name of Brian Lozinski. In this video, Lozinski says multiple times within the span of 80 seconds that the goal of critical race theory, CRT, is to overthrow America. And then he goes on to describe who is Brian Lozinski. All right. And then it, there's a lot of information in here, and I don't want to read the whole thing, but... Uh, you know, bottom line, uh, he's got a really good uh, feed right here, and I'll, I'll definitely put the link in. Oh, here it is. All right, Tom, Cl Cl I got got the link showing right now. TomGlenstein.com. We are still at war. All right. Uh, so this is. Uh, uh, the, oh, I did want to get back to uh, Syria for, for just one minute because I wanted to talk about Assad. 
there was a story, and I thought this was just a cute story. I uh, was aside recently within the last three weeks or a month or so, went to visit Putin in, in uh, Russia. Now, there's a lot of bad blood between Assad and Putin, uh, but they kind of get along uh, in, in a fashion. Uh, but anyway, I guess Putin was pissed, and he put Assad in a room, maybe with his bodyguards or whatever. And from what I understand, in this room, there was all kinds of, of art, artwork about the Ottoman versus Russian war. If you didn't know, the Ottoman uh, 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 Empire invaded Russia. And that was a hell of a uh, time for Russia. Uh, a lot of people died. And uh, anyway, the, the Russians uh, beat them back. And so he was torturing uh, er Erdogan <laughs> with all the artwork in this room. Now, from what I understand, he kept him in there at least 15 minutes. So I don't know how long he was in there, but I just thought that was a cute story. Uh, so this is more on Syria also. Breaking Hayat Tahrir Al-Sham have captured the al al Duha military base, Idlib direction, Syria. Abdim was captured overnight by Tahrir al-Sham, south of Aleppo. Wadihi has fallen to the Tahrir al-Sham. Tel Tuakan has fallen to the Tahrir al-Sham. And it will likely along with Sultan Highway that runs across the town that Tahrir al-Sham advanced 30 kilometers to capture Ab al Duha, the airbase. And then it goes on from there. I'll let you read it. Uh, it's just a lot of uh, information about what's going on. And uh, hopefully you're reading that right now. So let's just keep going. And he provided a video. Yeah, I can show this. I, there, here, watch the video. And, and you can read while, well, you know, you can't read while we watch. But this is the video right here. <laughs> all right so that's the video all right let's keep going uh, this was very interesting. I like this one. Uh, Insurrection Barbie. Net worth of public servants. <laughs> oh, my God. So Nancy Pelosi, on a salary of what, 200000 or so, is worth $252 million on her insider trading. Mark Warner is worth $246 million. Daniel Goldman is worth $184 million. Chuck Schumer is worth $75 million. I would have thought Chuck would be worth more than that. He's a, he's a grifting son of a gun. The one that really surprised me was Joe Biden here at $25 million. I think he's hit a lot of his, his riches outside the country because <laughs> he took money from China, Russia. I mean, there, anybody that would give Joe Biden money is, is – and then, of course, you got Barack Obama at only $70 million. Of course, his mansions. And that was something I was talking about today when I was made the video outside or yesterday was, uh, you know, I always wonder about what black people think. You know, now imagine if you're growing up in the hood or the Bronx in, in New York City and you're thinking, my brother, my brother, Barack, Barack, my brother, Barack, peace, man, peace, my brother, Barack. And, and, but you're living in squalor in, in a probably a, a roach infested apartment. And then you look at here's Barack, the Grifton uh, person that you voted for to help you out. And he's over on Martha's Vineyard with all the white people <laughs> hanging out. And, uh, and, and But the blacks are okay with that. I don't really understand that. I mean, that's a different type of thinking for me. It just says public service has been a very lucrative job, too lucrative if you ask me. Uh, this, was, this, is, this is probably where we'll, we'll tie things off. It says, uh, do you think Anthony Fauci still deserves uh, security detail and chauffeurs? Yes. 
you know, I, I keep doing that saying, kill one person, go to jail. Kill a million people, and it's just a statistic. So this guy, this war criminal, or this uh, genocidal murderer, kills a million people, and he it gets uh, still getting a chauffeur and a security detail. I, the world sometimes does not make sense to me. That's it, man. Whew. Rough, rough video. Peace out. Stay free. Americans today seem blissfully unaware of the dangers of war. For most Americans, war is something that happens thousands of miles away on someone else's soil. But this time, it's different. If nothing is done to end the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East, there is a real potential for the destruction Americans see only on television to reach our shores. Without carefully defined goals and interests, conflicts in both regions could race out of control and escalate. Washington's determination to preserve the illusion of American global hegemony ignores the fact that our economy is not capable of carrying the burden of a major war in Eastern Europe, Asia, or the Middle East. We are not reinvesting enough in new production capital, replacing outworn and outmoded technology. Our people do not enjoy a stable or preferably rising standard of living, which is measured in terms of both per capita consumption and life expectancy. Prices are not stable, and unemployment is growing, not shrinking. Our public and private educational institutions, once the envy of the world, wallow in mediocrity to accommodate political correctness and diversity.